Hello and welcome once again to Baked Beans Garage, where I'll tell you the right way to do something and then show you a different way. Right here I have the rebuilt D24T that's going to go into this here wagon. Uh, now this is a certified Craigslist rebuild. Uh, a friend of a friend obtained this from some guy with a beard and a shed, no doubt, many years ago. And I have absolutely no idea of the history of it, so today I'm going to peel it all apart, look at some things, even measure some things. I have some references, we'll see how good it is, and then maybe in a future episode it'll go back together. But it would be nice for this to eventually run, now that it's rust free. Not hole free, but rust free. Anyways, let's get into it. Now initial inspection is actually quite promising, clearly someone has taken the time to paint the block nice and good, the original color in here in the coolant galleries. We can see that that is just absolutely perfectly clean, which means either someone had this hot tanked or more likely electrolysis bathed. Uh, now the tape here on the intake and exhaust ports has clearly been there for probably the better part of a decade, but let's break that seal real quick. Once again, that is perfectly clean inside there. So this head is either brand new or manufactured, remanufactured. And this has never been attached, so I've already looked in here, but I cleaned up some old uh, preservation oil that was on the cam just so it looked shiny. But yeah, again, it's definitely been used, but pretty lightly actually. You can see somewhere on the tip of the lobes, but no cracking, the, that happens to these sometimes. Right here is that eccentric lobe that runs the vacuum pump on the side of the head, but we'll get to that. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna take the head off first because I need to crack the pulley bolt and this engine is not timed. So in case that slips when I have the wrench on it, I don't wanna slam a piston up into a valve. Uh, that would be bad. And over here I have a boat anchor and a paperweight so we can look at the differences between the six and the four hole flavors of these engines. So yeah, we'll... So the head hasn't actually been installed since I've had it. You may have noticed the absence of most of the head bolts, but I'll go ahead and act surprised when I take it off just so you can feel included. And for theatrics, of course. Oh wow, oh my, oh good heavens. How unexpected and also good. And with that off, we can clearly see that it has not run since it has last been apart. Is it a full rebuild? Who knows yet? Uh, however, I did notice right off the bat, 76.98 right on the top of the pistons here. The factory bore being 76.48. This thing has been overboard, if the pistons aren't lying to me. A whole half a millimeter. And for you Americans, that is 0 .3, 0 0.039 of a whole cheeseburger, rather. Uh, yeah, no carbon, no nothing. All the cylinder walls are absolutely perfect. Uh, over here on the head, again, just perfectly clean. Now, I said in a previous video you can't deck the head with these swirl chambers in, but someone just seems to have done that. Maybe you can, who knows? And the way I know it is reconditioned and not brand new is these cracks here. Uh, again, super common, but less than half a millimeter and Volkswagen says, nah, it's fine. And in all the coolant galleries and all of the intake and exhaust runners, it is just spotless. So yes, very nicely reconditioned. I'll still have to make sure it's all nice and good. I'll probably just do a leak down test. I don't see much point in actually taking the valves out. Anyways, let's flip that around and see what the downside looks like. So I'm definitely believing so far that this is actually rebuilt. Obviously, absolutely zero coking, nice and clean. Uh, no pistons in the oil pickup, which is nice. Also, they've re reused the little safety plate on the uh, pickup tube. Uh, oil's important. Now, uh, you saw me struggle with this last time, and to do it properly, you would ideally get Volvo tool number 5188 and 5187. Uh, but I, I don't have either of those, but I do have a ratchet strap. Come on now! Not exactly a ratchet strap, but the strap part of the ratchet strap. No straps and ratchet. And what I'm gonna do is just wait. Let's go this way. Righty tighty, lefty tighty, righty wait. Just gonna try one way, and then when it doesn't work, I'll try the other way. And then hook this onto something. And then it's gonna move. Oh, that's making it difficult, 
actual ring tension. There we go. It's a 27 M&M's, just like the injectors. How convenient. <clears throat> ah. No satisfying pop, but it's coming loose. And with that big bolt out of the way, there's just four hex keys inside here. And this dampener should just either slide off or tap off with a mallet. Oh, nice and easy. Now we can get to our main pulley. And this is one of the very few, few times you'll actually hear me recommend using the proper tool for something. Because trying to pry this off with screwdrivers, you will absolutely break it. Hmm, my puller seems to be too small. Let me find something. I have found something to make it close enough to the right size. Uh, usually it's it's tight question mark anyways the rarest of occasions has occurred I have had a brainwave uh, foresight I'm gonna flip this back over and measure my piston protrusion now so I can try to get a, a head gasket ordered if they even exist anymore so let's do that and again here's the only reason why I want to do this now here's a 0 0.06 millimeter feeler gauge that Tolerance here is 0.2 millimeters. So yeah, this thing it this thing's dead flat. None of these measurements are gonna change, so I'm gonna try to find a head gasket now. Anyway, I have my totally not cobbled together dial indicator and mag base, so I'm gonna give her a scrape because we got some crusties on here. Alright, so we're gonna zero it out on the head surface here. Oof. This is not precision. It'll be close enough. And then we will drag it over to the piston and then introduce said piston. Ah, about 31 thousandths. Okay. Let me look at the book and see what that means. Twenty-six to thirty-one thousandths, one point four millimeter head gasket. The thinnest one. And now that we know that's at least good enough, if I can get the part, we'll see. I'm gonna do a little montage of just disassembling everything. Uh, this time I didn't have the foresight to take the rear main seal housing off before I put it on the stand. So that's difficult, but not impossible. Gotta snag that guy off. We'll remove the oil pump, the water pump, and take this whole bottom end apart, get the rods and pistons out, and we'll do some measuring on her. And while that's apart, we'll have a look at the old verses here. The D24 versus the 1.6D. I'll look at the head and the block separately and all their little differences and their various pumps, how they're different. And there we are, all apart. So clearly, this engine hasn't done much more than getting turned over by hand. All these bearings are just brand new and everything is looking just gorgeous. Uh, so I'm gonna get this flipped around and we'll do some comparing between this and the 1.6. Clearly no secret as to why this thing is a boat anchor and hey, these 1.6s, they're, they're pretty bulletproof engines, but as we all know, six in a row is the way to go. We'll begin with the cooling system here. This has this, like I said, the goofy ah, water pump tensioner assembly which i guess works great from the factory but i imagine pitting will become an issue because when you have that o-ring sitting in the same spot for 30 years and then you go to move it you're gonna have some pitting and you might get a leak over here we have the external water pump what's driven by the accessory belts on the 1.6 furthermore the thermostat housing on the d24 is right on the side of the block the uh, 1.6 it'll be down here hanging off the side. Uh, oiling arrangement, we have the, this did not have a factory oil cooler. 
Okay, so this is normal across both 1.6 and D24s. Turbos had oil to water intercoolers. NA engines did not have any oil cooler. Yeah, you get nice and warm. Furthermore, we can see the crankcase breather on the side of the block here. On the D24s, everything went through the valve cover. And lastly, probably the biggest difference on the block itself, the 1.6 has an auxiliary shaft, not a balance shaft, there's no weights on it, but right here, what's driven by the timing belt, that is in the same spot as the water pump on the D24. Now, on the 1.6, that auxiliary shaft goes back here and it runs both the vacuum pump and the oil pump, which goes down there. On the D24, we have a bit more sophisticated of a setup. Actually simpler when you think about it, but more sophisticated. So here's the water pump from a 1.6. Just a regular gear pump assembly, but under here we have my favorite mechanical movement. It is a G-rotor pump. Oh, just makes a fella weak in the knees. I love that. But yes, much more modern arrangement and fewer moving parts. Moving right along to the head, we can see that they're clearly written in the same font. They did come with valves. I took them out of here, don't worry about that. Very rare, actually. We don't have the cracks. This thing must have been babied. I don't know what happened, but the one lifter bore is just chewed right out of it. She's a paperweight. But yeah, clearly. Same injector, glow plug, swirl chamber, valves, all that's the same. Strangely though, we can see five bosses for the cam bearings on the 1.6. D24, despite being 20% longer, we only got four. I don't know. They must have thought it was good enough. Biggest difference being that eccentric lobe on the middle drives the uh, vacuum pump, which sits right here on a D24 like Zo, And we have the push rod, which yanks on that little doohickey right there. And on the inward side, it, come on! Just chooches that, not a diaphragm, but actually a piston back and forth. And these check valves here do the regulating on the air just to make a vacuum. This thing's seized and pretty much trash. Now the early 1.6s had a diaphragm style pump like that with the eccentric cam lobe. The later ones got this, which is the vein type pump. Uh, I, I took this apart to demonstrate how bulletproof they are and how they don't break like the vacuum pumps, but this one's actually broken. We can see the galling right here. These veins, as it spins around, it's like a reverse air motor in a die grinder. Instead of running off of pressure, it creates a vacuum. But yeah, these veins would slide out from centrifugal force going that way around, but this galling from metal getting in there, they have jammed. This could probably be saved. We'll see if I need it later. Also, the check valves like to break off, but you can just JB weld a brass nipple in there and use an external check valve. Anyway, that's the D24T versus the 1.6. And moving right along to the actual engine work stuff, we're gonna do some measuring. Now, the, this is just a set of Harbor Freight stuff. I don't really care. As long as they are precise, they don't need to be very accurate because we don't really care about the absolute measurements of everything. All we want to know is the clearances between this thing and that thing. What for making sure they're not going to be like the hot dog down the hallway, but also making sure they're not going to interfere and clamp together and send metal everywhere. So the Harbor Freight set's good enough. Now, if this were my engine, I'd just slam it back together like it is because I trust it's been rebuilt good enough, you know, for my standards. But since this belongs to the benefactor, I'm gonna go through and measure everything, make sure my clearances are good, and then slam it back together. So to accomplish that, all I'm gonna do is, you know, mic every journal in two spots to establish both roundness and dimensions. Same thing, I'm gonna to torque all of the uh, rod bearings and torque all of the main caps. Mic those two places to establish roundness as well as all the bores in three spots up and down to make sure they're straight make sure they're round and make sure my diameter is good. And then I'm gonna take the rings off, as scary as it is, and I hate doing, I'm gonna check the gaps just to be safe. So yeah, measurement montage. And I'm actually gonna write things down this time. That's very unlike me.
with that, I'm pretty happy to report that this thing is just dandy. So we got all our ring gaps checked, we got all our bearing clearances checked, and they are spot on. Interestingly enough, although the block is overboard, the crankshaft has all original measurements. So I'm thinking this is just a new crankshaft, not a machined one. Not sure when this engine was put together, maybe they were gettable whenever that happened. They certainly aren't now, but who knows. And again, these are all new, obviously being overboard. And there's all my numbers there if you don't believe me. I had one of the uh, main bearing caps backwards in case you noticed that when I was measuring. I did correct it, as you can see. As far as the head goes, I don't think I'm gonna take it apart at all. I can see down in here, the valves have been newly machined. Even the valve guides are brand new. Very nice and tidy, just gonna check the clearances because these are solid lifters. Ring gaps, all good. I checked it with the 12 and then the 21. The acceptable range is 12 to 21 thousandths. So I just poked her with the 12, then the 21, and then the 22 just to make sure it didn't go in. And that all looks good. So now I'm gonna focus on cleaning up this here uh, mating surface. And here I have some 500 grit stapled onto a piece of wood that's probably mostly flat. I don't know. Now, if your head's warped or if your block's warped, this ain't gonna help. This is just to clean up any residue from your old head gasket or corrosion here. And that's looking a little better. That'll seal nice and good to the new head gasket if one can be obtained. Not even sure about that yet. But yeah, when, whenever you do some of this precision machine work, you wanna seal it up with some oil. Uh, any flavor will do just so it doesn't rust, this being cast iron. Now I said that block technique won't work if it's warped. Uh, if you have an aluminum head that is warped, you can glue some heavy grit sandpaper down to some plate glass, lubricate it, and then slide the head back and forth a bunch till it's flat enough. That's a nice uh, poor man's machining method works good enough. Anyways, uh, I think that's about it for this episode. We've confirmed it's all good. I gotta get some gaskets and then we will put the bolts back in next episode. And I do apologize for a bit of a boring episode this week. I had some adult responsibilities get in the way of my productivity here. In the future, I will do my best to neglect those responsibilities and only work on old garbage for your entertainment. Uh, anyways, I think I'm going to clean this block up a little bit. I'm going to try to order a head gasket. Hopefully I can find a 1.4 millimeter. I'm not sure yet. Everything I've seen so far is a 1.5, but it'll run eventually at the very least. We'll see. If you've enjoyed this video in any manner, please do like and subscribe. I'm trying to grow this channel. And uh, anyways, this is Baked Beans Garage. I am Chinchilla. I will see you next time.